You're listening to Little Green Cheese, episode 65. Well, welcome back, Curd Nerds. I'm Gavin Weber, and this podcast is where you can learn about cheese making at home. After a sizable absence, I'm back on the podcasting push bike, uh, so to speak. But anyway, there's going to be regular podcast episodes now as we move into the final quarter or close to the final half of the of uh, 2017. So what's been going on in my cheese world? Well, uh, quite a lot. Let me just let me just get get this out there. I have been focusing the vast majority of my time on my YouTube channel, and the YouTube channel is Cheeseman.tv. If you are new to the show, and I have been doing a live Q and A on Wednesday mornings. Uh, That's Australian Melbourne time. And then over the weekends, I've been frantically making cheese to create cheese-making video tutorials. And those tutorials usually go up on uh, Saturday, either Saturday or Sunday, depends on how the cheese is going, how it's maturing, and how much footage I can squeeze into the video and how much I have to do in a a separate video. Like, you know, a lot of cheeses uh, take uh, quite a long time to mature. So... I try and get them up to a point where people people can actually make them. And then from there, uh, I, then I'll do a follow-up video later on um, based on, you know, what I've done to the cheese uh, during maturation or if I've done anything at all, I've just let it mature. Anyway, so a couple of the cheeses that I've got in the fridge uh, right now, I've got a double Gloucester uh, that's maturing in the fridge. I've also got... Uh, in a ripening box, I've got Port Salut, which is a washed rind, washed curd, smeared ripened cheese uh, that originated um, out of France uh, many years ago and created by Trappist monks. Now, this is a is a smear ripened cheese and uses Brevibacterium linens to create a, a red smear or orange smear on the outside of the cheese. And it's really a ripening bacteria. And what that does with the addition of mesophilic culture uh, that you initially inoculate the milk with, you also add in Breviobacteria linens, just a, a little bit of it. And that uh, helps and give this uh, an amazing flavour. It really is. If you've never made a uh, smear ripened cheese before, you're missing out. You really need to give it a go because I find that And I've made two or three now, and they are just amazing. They may smell. (laughs) The Brevibacterium linens is very similar to the bacteria that lives between your toes, of all things. But it's not the same bacteria. (laughs) It's similar. And it has, uh, when it ripens, it does pong just a little bit. Pong in Australia means smell. Uh, So... Yeah, so you get used to the smell when you open up the ripening box and you uh, and and you wash the cheese um, twice a week. You, you get used to it. Certainly, Kim doesn't get used to it. Um, she complains every time I open up the cheese fridge, but when she eats the cheese, uh, there's certainly no complaining there. So it's something you just got to put up with if you're making those type of smear ripened cheeses. Anyway, we've got an action pack show today. So what I'm going to be doing is going back to the old format because I don't do a pre-recorded Ask the Cheese Man anymore on YouTube. I do a live stream instead. Um, What I'm not going to use those live streams. They're too choppy to reformat the content into something that's suitable for a podcast. So what I'm going to do is go back to the older type format where we have Uh, We have some news, so I'll read some news out uh, that I found on the interwebs. Basically, talk about a a cheese of the month, and then we're going to listen to and reply back to 
some listener questions that have been sent in via voicemail. Now, because I haven't recorded the uh, podcast since, oh, I think it was April uh, 2017, and it's now, uh, what is it, August 2017, I have swags of voicemails. And for all those who have sent them in, thank you so much for being patient. Uh, we will do um, two or three or four today, depends on how short they are and how easy the uh, the answers are, and we'll go from there. Anyway, bear with me over the next few weeks. I'll get through quite a few of them, um, but do send them in. Uh, go to littlegreencheese.com and use the SpeakPipe widget. It's on just about every podcast episode, and uh, you won't have any trouble recording a voicemail question uh, for the for this show. Um, if you want to do it live, uh, and you want to get an answer straight away, then Wednesdays mo- Wednesday mornings on cheeseman.tv is where you should go to get an instant answer. However, if you're happy to wait, like a, l- a lot of these people have, a lot of these curd nerds have, then, uh, yeah, voicemail will, will be sufficient. Anyway, it's time for the news. So today's news is from uh, it's from a New Zealand website called Dairy News. Don't, don't we mustn't have dairy news here in Australia? But anyway, the title is Fonterra resumes pizza cheese production in Oz, uh, which is pretty big news apparently. So Fonterra is eyeing a bigger slice of the booming Asian pizza business for its Australian made cheese. Mozzarella production is resuming in Australia at the co-op's new cheese plant in Stanhope, uh, northern Victoria. The plant will officially be opened on Friday. So that would be, oh, this week. So it's going to open this week. So Fonterra Australia Manager Director Rene Dedon Kerr says, China particularly has strong demand for the cheese, which tops at least half the pizzas made there. In China, the growth of Western-style food service outlets has meant more opportunities for Chinese people to try cheese, and many are developing a taste for it, particular on, particularly on pizza. The market potential is enormous. I dare say it is seeing there's, what, 1.2 billion people in China. Anyway, I'll read on. Uh, farmers Jared and Courtney Island run a 450-cow dairy farm in the rural town of Lockington in northern Victoria. Their fresh milk is supplied to Fonterra's Stanhope plant and will be used to make mozzarella uh, for China. Courtney says he enjoys seeing his milk going to high-value mozzarella for China. My family loves eating pizza and we can tell our children our farm's milk goes into making mozzarella for pizzas in China. Stanhope's new cheese plant coming online gives us confidence in a strong, sustainable future for dairy in Australia. Uh, goes on to say about 40% of people in urban China now eat at Western-styled fast food outlets once a week, and the use of dairy in food service has grown 30% in five years. As disposable income rises in China, spending on dining out is growing and pizza is a popular menu choice. Yep, so that's basically what's going on. So Stanhope, which is uh, what a couple of hundred kilometres away from where we live, uh, is going to have a brand new mozzarella making cheese making plant, which is fantastic news. So the cheese of the week. I have had many requests for a brie video tutorial. Now, I, I've made brie once before, and the problem with, uh, with the way I made it was I only made it with six litres of milk, and it was too thin. It was only about, oh, it had to be a centimetre high, and that is not the right height for a brie. And what happened when I flipped it over and I'm using a, oh, it must be, I don't know how wide the mould is. It's rather large. It's a half brie mould, so half the size the normal brie wheels are. Uh, it must be about oh, nearly 20 centimetres across. 
Uh, so quite large. And when I flipped it over, the cheese broke in half. And uh, and it wasn't growing mould like it should have been. I, all sorts of things were not happening to this brie that I was trying to make. So remember the, the difference between camembert and traditional camembert and traditional brie is the size of the wheel and I think a few degrees in temperature during production and a few other little slight nuances. But really it's the size of the cheese, those Little cheeses you get that look the same size as camembert are not brie. They're petite brie or petite brie, small brie, and uh, they're mainly for the the consumer market, the, the supermarket um, consumer. Normal size brie is large size, and you usually get to see it sold in wedges, so uh, quite large wedges of cheese. So I'm going to give uh, brie a go very soon. However... Um, Kim and I are actually going to a cheese festival um, here in Melbourne. I think tickets are nearly sold out. It's called the Mould Festival, as in M-O-U-L-D, Mould. And it's going to be a cheese and wine sort of thing. There's going to be cheese makers from um, all over Australia. And these are artisan cheese makers who sell small batches, um, not big production companies like uh, Fonterra or Bega. Yeah, they're the main ones uh, here in Australia. But, uh, yeah, so they won't be the big players. It'll be the small players, the people who have their own small dairies, make their own cheese, value-add sort of stuff. So it should be really interesting to see different styles of cheese. And I think there's some um, some small brewery ciders and beers and, and wine makers as well. So Kim and I should uh, roll out there full of cheese and <laughs> full of a few drinks. So that should be quite interesting. That's happening on the... 2nd of September, so that'll be in Melbourne at uh, North Melbourne in, I think it's the meat market, but anyway, go on, I'll put a link in the show notes, I think tickets are just about sold out anyway, so if you can get your hands on some, I think you're quite lucky at this stage, seeing it's only like three weekends, two weekends actually, um, until the Mould Festival, should be good fun. Um, Kim and I are going to do a vlog of the event, Uh, just a quick one, yeah, it should be good fun. Anyway, so that's for the cheese of the week. Uh, Let's get on to some listener questions, shall we? Okay, the first listener question is, and I'm sorry it's like four months old, but uh, anyway, uh, this one's from Santiago. So I'm going to play this voicemail question now. Hello, um, Gavin. This is um, Santiago from uh, Hong Kong. I would like to comment on your last video uh, where you uh, explained why you make cheese at home and why it makes a financial sense to make um, cheese at home. Well, here in Hong Kong, um, cheese is outrageously expensive, but so is everything else. I have sort of calculated that um, the cost of, for me, for making cheese at home, whether it be from fresh milk or, which is, fresh milk, for example, here's about $4 US a litre, um, or uh, powdered milk with, uh, of course, mineral water, uh, is about three times or maybe even four times what it would cost me in in Europe. Um, and of course, that is uh, including or factoring in uh, what it takes me to bring my or email or mail, sorry, my equipment uh, from the UK or from the US. And I don't buy from your store because you don't ship to Hong Kong. But it is the satisfaction the long nights I spend listening to your very, very informative and entertaining videos about how to make different types of cheeses. Um, All those cheeses I have made in the last uh, nine months since I started uh, with this hobby, uh, most of them, about 80% of them, have gone wrong in the sense that they all taste absolutely the same, regardless of the type of cheese I was trying to make. I'm getting better at it. 
and it just allows me the satisfaction of uh, eating or of having something which I have done myself. I don't know whether this helps. I have tried to also to uh, patron you or whatever or support you. I don't know whether I've managed. I hope I have. Anyway, all the best from Hong Kong. And again, this is the highest creamery in the world, a 60th floor uh, overlooking Victoria Bay. Good night. Well, that's fantastic, Santiago. I really appreciate it. Yeah, so all your cheeses tasting the same sounds, it sounds like a, a starter culture issue because if you use the same starter culture for different varieties of cheese, you'll find that they do taste the same. For instance, I now use, for camembert anyway, I use a strain of culture, an aromatic mesophilic. So usually Flora Danica uh, by C.H.R. Hansen is a very good culture to use for anything with that you want a, a buttery flavour or a buttery um, taste to it. Whereas on the other hand, if you want to make things like cheddars and stuff like that, I'll stick to a uh, start, mesophilic starter culture like uh, MO30 from Sacco or um, there's a mesophilic MW3, I think it is, from Mad Millie. Um, and they're pretty good, very similar starter cultures. And uh, they give that cheddary sort of sharpness to, to those sorts of cheese. And obviously thermophilic culture, again, if you're making... Uh, Italian or, uh, or Alpine style cheeses, then thermophilic culture will give you a totally different flavour profile as well. So thanks, and um, just for all the listeners out there, um, Santiago actually has purchased quite a few things from us now. We managed to work out the bugs. There was a bug on our website that wouldn't let uh, anybody ship to Hong Kong. Um, we since fixed all that, and uh, Santiago certainly does support the 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 YouTube channel via Super Chats uh, during the uh, live shows, which are a, a lovely way to support the channel and, and some of the work that I do. Anyway, thanks again, Santiago. I really appreciate um, all the support you've given me uh, in my cheesemaking journey. Anyway, all right, on with the next question. This one's from Martine. Hi, Gavin. My name is Martine and I live in France. I have a question for you, please. Uh, is there a substitute that I could use for lipase when using cow's milk? Could I use goat's yogurt? And if so, how much? Uh, I do have access to raw goat's milk, uh, if that would help. Thanks. I really appreciate the opportunity to ask you this. And uh, by the way, great videos that you post. Thank you. Well, thanks, Martine. Appreciate the question. There is no substitute that I know of for uh, lipase. So there are a few types of lipase. There's cow's lipase or, or um, what's a baby cow called? <laughs> calf. <laughs> a calf. Uh, you've seen I've been out of the game for a while. So calf lipase is a lot mild, milder than what kid lipase is. Uh, remembering that lipase is a pre-gastric enzyme that is, I think it's gained from the back of the tongue or something like that. So it is not uh, vegetarian or vegan friendly, but it is, it does add an amazing flavour, pecan flavour to most of the cheeses that it's added to. And it breaks down fats uh, into flavoids that, uh, that over time manifest themselves in the cheese and taste really amazing. Now, that doesn't mean you can't get the right flavours. So what you can do is use goat's milk, which has uh, lipase in it. So what you can do, Martine, is use, say, 20% goat's milk and 80% cow's milk in your cow's milk recipe. You may need to adjust the rennet a little bit more to get it to set properly, but if you do that, you'll still start to get the pecan flavour. So if you make... Um, say parmesan uh, and you're not using uh, raw milk uh, and you needed to add a uh, lipase then what you can do is like i said add 20 percent uh, goat's milk so that will help if you add goat's yogurt if you can get your hands on that that is actually a good thermophilic culture and it will also have lipase in it 
Um, so not only are you adding a starter culture when you use yogurt, and when you do use yogurt for the ratio that I do normally is about 3%. So that's uh, 160, sorry, 170 grams of yogurt to 12 litres of milk. And that'll give you enough to inoculate the milk. Hopefully it won't smell too yogurty, but it will work uh, as a thermophilic starter culture as well. So Martin, hopefully that answers your question. And sorry, it's taken me so long to, uh, to put it on the show and, and get it out there. Anyone, anyway, the next one is from, oh, not sure. Anyway, let's play it and see what see what happens. Hi, Gavin. Uh, my name is Algendi. I'm calling from Belgium. I have a question for you. Uh, are you able to make uh, old Amsterdam cheese? Please let me know if you do. Thank you very much. Bye. Elgendi, um, thanks very much for your question, mate. Um, all the way from Belgium. Lovely. So Old Amsterdam is a aged Gouda style cheese uh, made with pasteurised cow's milk. It's from the Netherlands and it is um, named after the capital city, of course. <laughs> and um, uh, it has only been around for only for what's that, 30, 40 years. 1985 was when it was first introduced on the market. The cheese. Um, it uses it. I think it uses a traditional uh, Gouda recipe, and it's aged for two years. So it also has these little funny crystals in them, and it's called uh, calcium lactate. Uh, calcium lactate's often found in aged cheddars, um, certainly in Parmesan, uh, Romano, uh, and some Swiss cheeses, but it's definitely in aged Gouda. Uh, so. Uh, old Amsterdam has, and it gives it a, 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 a an amazing added flavour and texture to the to the dense body of that cheese. So basically, what you could do um, is make my Gouda recipe and simply age it instead of for the I think it's three months or something that I aged it for. You can age it for two years, and you'd have yourself a very wicked old Amsterdam. So um, it sounds like a good video to actually make, even though I've made uh, I've made a couple of Gouda recipes. Um, so I've done a normal Gouda recipe on um, on the YouTube channel. I've also made Leiden, which is basically Gouda with uh, cumin seeds in it. Um, and both of those cheeses worked out really well. The Gouda did start to develop small eyes. But from the pictures I'm looking at uh, of old Amsterdam, it also has um, small eyes in the cheese. So I think you could probably use that traditional recipe and age it for the two years and you would have old Amsterdam and uh, have a very nice cheese. Um, I would uh, vac pack it probably after about six months of rind development because the rind looks pretty thick on the cheese. We're, we're talking about about a two centimetre rind on the pictures that I'm looking at. So that indicates to me that's probably about ooh, six months worth of maturation uh, at a right temperature and then I vac pack it and it'll probably turn out the same, especially for the home cheese maker if you're only using like 10 litres of milk. Anyway, hopefully that answers your question, El Gendi. Uh, thanks for sending it in, mate. We'll do one final question to wrap up the show, and this one's from David. Hi, Gavin. A friend of mine and I were having a discussion, and he stated that if cheese is beyond the expiration, you have to throw it away. It goes bad. There's nothing more to it. I had always heard that cheese doesn't expire, that it basically becomes more cheesy. If you could... Uh, Give your opinion. What do you think? Does cheese go bad? Well, thanks for your question, David. It depends on what type of cheese. Now, if you are talking about fresh cheese, which I don't think you are, yes, fresh cheese does go bad. As soon as it starts getting all sorts of funky moulds on it, uh, it's time to throw the fresh cheese away. However, I've been known to eat yogurt at least three months past its best before date or use by date and I'm not dead um, because it was in a sealed container and no other bacterias 
um, or molds could get into it. So that's an example that I'll use there. I've got a pretty hardy stomach though, I think, um, from all of the bacteria that are swimming around from all the different types of cheeses that I eat. However, I think you're referring to hard cheese. And really, technically, there is no expiry date, even though that food standards throughout the world probably dictate that they have to have some sort of best before date on them. For instance, have a look at the oh the uh, the vintage cheddar that I made. Um, basically, started off as a normal cloth banded cheddar. At six months, I took the cloth off, tried it. I liked it, but I didn't like it enough to eat it all. So I let it age for another six months. So that's one full year of cheese just sitting at 13 degrees Celsius in the right conditions, of course. And that matured and turned out into a fantastically, um, fantastically, I don't know if that's a word, an amazing cheese. Uh, and same as I've made uh, Manchego and Parmesan, and they've aged for at least 18 months. So there's a year and a half sitting at, you know, 13 degrees Celsius, and they certainly don't go off. They just get better with age. Now, you have to make sure that you don't get unwanted moulds, and unwanted moulds usually come in the form of black mould. So if it's got black mould on it, it depends on how far the roots go down into the cheese, then the cheese could be bad. But if it's stored in the right conditions and it's free from black mould, and most other white moulds, and it's wiped clean and all that sort of stuff during maturation, then the cheese just gets better and better and better. And the, and the flavours in the fats um, get broke, the flat fats get broken down by the, um, the, dare I say, the rotting starter cultures and turn them into flavoids. And they really do give you an amazing flavour profile. So your friend is partly correct if you're talking about fresh cheese then yes, they will expire and become bad. However, if you're talking about aged cheeses or uh, hard cheese, then no, you can age them for a very long time. In fact, there's been cheese found in tombs, you know, dating back thousands of years, and they still reckon the cheese is okay. So there you go. So yes and no is the answer. Hope that helps. David. Well, that's all we've got time for this week. Um, We're up to the 30-minute mark. I don't really want to go much longer than that because the average commute is only about 30 minutes, so I've been told. So, Or I'll run out of questions for next week's show. Anyway, thanks, everybody, for sending in those questions. They're fantastic. Hopefully you enjoyed the news and the Cheese of the Month segment. And uh, watch out for a, a Brie video. I'm going to give it another go very soon. Um, and that will be on cheeseman.tv. So for upcoming cheese making workshop dates, you can check those out over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au slash cheesemaking. Uh, if you want to pick up a copy of my ebook, Keep Calm and Make Cheese, A Beginner's Guide to Cheese Making at Home, that's available over at littlegreencheese.com. You can also find all of my video tutorials over at cheeseman.tv and that'll whisk you away to my YouTube channel. Don't forget that you can buy kits and cheese making supplies over at littlegreenworkshops.com.au and that's about it, I think. Thanks for listening, Curd Nerds, and stay tuned for the next episode of the Little Green Cheese Podcast. During this podcast, you heard royalty-free music by Kevin MacLeod. I played Malt Shop Bop, the news theme, and Call to the Dairy Cows. See you, curd nerds.